Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Bar of Ireland, you're all very welcome to the second lecture in the 2021 Green Street Lecture Series. We're here in the wonderful surroundings of the Benchers Room in the Honourable Society of the King's Inns, and we want to thank the Inns for their facility in allow allowing us to use this room. This afternoon, we have a wonderful speaker, Marguerite Bulger, Senior Counsel, who is going to speak on the topic of From Rogues to Role Models in Equality Law. So Marguerite, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and I'd like to thank the Bar for inviting me to address you on the topic of the evolution of employment equality law in Ireland and a paper that I've entitled From Rogues to Role Models, and hopefully as we work through the themes you'll understand why I chose that title. As Paul said, we stand here today in this wonderful space that is the Benchers Room, a beautiful space that was, like many other spaces in Irish society, denied to women for many, many years. And even today, we're still waiting to see the first picture of a woman on these walls. Mella Carroll, a pioneer at the bar and on the bench, was the first female elected bar bencher. And she, like many other trailblazers before her, had to break through obstacles and smash through glass ceilings in order to assert their right to participate in the labor market and in civic society. The position of Irish women, and indeed members of minority groups in this country, has progressed exponentially since the beginning of the 20th century. The law has played a part in that change and its protection and intervention was a hugely important weapon in the fight for equality. The story of how Irish equality law barely moved for years and then changed explosively through the 70s and the 80s is a journey through constitutional norms, historic attitudes, international standards, and the interplay of economic and social forces. Irish equality law was a bleak area, at least up until 1973, when Ireland joined the European communities. Our membership of the European communities was the fillip for challenging discrimination in the workplace. More changes were effected within months of our accession to the EC in 1973 than had been secured over previous decades of legal challenges to discrimination. This included equal pay for equal work, in spite of the, the opposition and the outrage that was voiced against it from at least some sections of Irish society. By the 1980s, with retrospective irony, Ireland found itself ahead of many other member states within the European communities in how we interpreted our obligations of European equality law. A surprisingly radical approach was adopted by the Irish courts in outlawing both sexual harassment and pregnancy discrimination in the workplace. And by the 1990s, the legislature had implemented groundbreaking legislation which extended the traditional European principles of sex equality to a number of other grounds. And in fact, it took the European Union until 2006 to catch up with this state that had been dragged into recognizing the very basic right to equal pay over 30 years earlier. So what I want to do is to examine these developments, firstly to look at what we mean by equality, and then to look at equality by reference to the Irish Constitution and how its provisions on equality were inspired by the principles of the proclamation of the Irish Republic and its interpretation aided by the jurisprudence of US civil rights legislation. <clears throat> 
I will look at European constitutional law and how equality as a fundamental right expanded within what was initially a European Union. I'll examine how, I, how employment equality finally came about for Irish women upon Ireland's accession to the European communities in 1973 and Ireland's journey from reluctantly recognising equality as the price of our membership of the European club to showing leadership in using the law to tackle discrimination in the workplace. So firstly, I want to look at what, what do we mean by equality or what does equality mean? And equality as a, com as a concept is spectacularly simple but also remarkably complex. Every child who has ever complained that their sibling was being treated better than they were instinctively understands equality. But at the same time, it is a concept that is slippery and elusive to define at a legal and political level. Aristotle's principle of equality requires that things that are alike should be treated alike, while things that are unalike should be treated unalike in proportion to their unalikeness. And this is what we refer to as the formal model of equality. It's premised on the idea that there are no important or immutable differences between individuals that justify their different treatment. Historically, this model of equality was used by women in their fight for access to education, employment, and suffrage. It was, it was supported by the philosopher John Stuart Mills, who believed that perfect equality could be achieved by removing the barriers to women's participation in society, such as the denial of their right to vote or the right of married women to own property. Formal equality was espoused in the struggle of the American civil rights movement to remove the legal system of racial segregation whose laws and practices excluded and restricted African Americans. So formal equality was and still can be an effective tool for removing restrictions which prevent women and members of minority groups from entering and participating in public life and the workplace. The challenge is that it requires agreement as to how we determine what cases are alike, which are different, which forms of distinction are legitimate and which are not. Formal equality is limited in its ability to deal with people who fall into different groups with different needs and different abilities across different areas. So certainly formal equality can achieve equality of opportunity, but it cannot attack the more institutional forms of discrimination and therefore may not always achieve equality of outcome. A more substantive form of equality is required in order to challenge occupational segregation and labour market disadvantages. So what we call substantive equality seeks to go beyond equality that is premised around a male norm of a person who is male, white, able-bodied, heterosexual, with a Judeo-Christian background. Work for that person is structured around the assumption that the worker has had access to a good education, is not subject to conscious bias or unconscious bias, and has their childcare and their domestic responsibilities taken care of by others. And those norms and values have to be questioned and reformed if real equality is ever to be achieved. The differences that do exist between persons must be acknowledged and that may mean giving special treatment in order to achieve fairness. And that obviously is an exception to the strict equality principle. Classic example of substantive 
equality and special treatment is the right to maternity leave. Uh, special treatment can also be justified by other circumstances, it could be historical disadvantage, racism, structural discrimination, embedded prejudice, or a need to take differing physical abilities into account caused by ageing or disability. Positive action or affirmative action is a, a good example of a more radical application of substantive equality. The constitutional principle in the Irish Constitution in Article 40, Section 1, is clearly limited to a model of formal rather than substantive equality. Having said that, there have been occasions when the article on equality, 40 section 1, has been nudged by the Irish courts towards a more progressive scope. For example, in MD in Ireland, uh, when the Supreme Court upheld the offence of statutory rape against males only, the then Chief Justice Denham observed that the principle of equal treatment <coughs> of all human persons, not just citizens, was implicit in the free and democratic nature of the state and permeated the Constitution. Shortly afterwards, in the case of Murphy and Ireland, uh, O'Donnell, in upholding the jurisdiction of the Special Criminal Court, described Article 40, Section 1 as setting an egalitarian and essentially republican tone, which he said was a vital and essential component of the constitutional order. It's just a pity that those themes explored in those cases have very much been the exception rather than the rule in Irish constitutional jurisprudence. So I want to move now to look at 40 section 1, the, the constitutional principle of equality in the Irish constitution, which provides all citizens shall, as human persons, be held equal before the law. This shall not be held to mean that the state shall not in its enactments have due regard to differences of capacity, physical and moral, and of social functions. This concept of equality before the law has an impressive political origin going back to the French Declaration on the Rights of Man in 1793. Closer to home, the proclamation of the Irish Republic in 1916 guaranteed equal rights and equal opportunities to all of its citizens. Again, a statement so powerful in its simplicity. But the most cursory of reviews of how that guarantee has actually been implemented in Irish law since 1916 confirms that proclaiming equality came easier to the leaders of 1916 than promoting equality came to their political descendants. Bunrak Naharan seemed to elevate equality, at least before the law, to a position of stated importance. But in truth, from the very beginning, the commitment to equality was far more aspirational than real. During the Doyle debates on the draft constitution, Eamon de Valera described Article 40, Section 1 as recognising the impartiality of judicial behaviour and the principle that legislation should not be discriminatory as between classes. So his intention in, in implementing the article was to secure civil and political equality. And he believed that social equality should be left to the Oireachtas. He expressly rejected the wording without distinction on grounds of sex in formulating the article on equality because he said he found it to be objectionable and unnecessary. So in spite of those views and his constitutional classification of the position of women in the home, he denied that the 1937 constitution intended to weaken the position of women or interfere with their rights. In spite of that, it soon became very apparent that for Article 40, Section 1 was highly unlikely to progress the position of women or minority groups in Irish society, and indeed 
that it would be relied on to justify the exclusion of women from civic and work spaces. I want to move on to look at how the equality principle in the Irish constitution has been interpreted and what we see is largely in a very restrictive manner. The Irish constitutional order reflects a liberal egalitarian interpretation of the scope of the equality principle which confines itself to protecting the individual against certain forms of prejudice without being concerned with challenging the inherent inequalities of existing social structures. Formal equality is the only concept recognised and there has been little concern for substantive equality. There certainly has been a generous application of the equality principle in the civil political sphere, but a reluctance to engage the principle of equality in the socio-economic sphere. The equality principle has sometimes come into conflict with other constitutional values. And where this has occurred, the Irish courts have almost invariably preferred the other constitutional values. Now, classical conservative thought, reminiscent of Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, would require other values, such as the role of the family, social order, and religious belief to be prioritized over equality. And that approach is consistent with the overall value scheme of the Irish constitution, which of course had its inspiration in Catholic social teaching of the 1930s. And a case that illustrates this very well is the, the seminal decision of OB and S from the early 80s. This was the case in which succession rights for children born within marriage uh, were found to operate to exclude uh, the non-marital child, and that was upheld. So the Supreme Court did accept that there wasn't any difference of physical, moral capacity, or social function, which could justify treating the non-marital child less favorably than what at the time was referred to as legitimate offspring. But the court then went on to find that discrimination between the marital and non-marital child was justified by the protection from marriage and the family based on marriage afforded by Article 41, and clearly chose to prioritize that constitutional provision over the constitutional provision of equality. So that was just one example of, of many restrictive applications of Article 41 by the courts. And it occurred not only in family matters, but also in employment. In 1972, ironically, only one year before Ireland joined the European communities and everything changed, uh, the case of Myrta Properties and Cleary came before the court. This involved a trade union that had placed a picket on the plaintiff's premises because the plaintiff was a bar who had employed female bar attendants. In fact, it was only lawful to even employ women in a licensed premises since 1967, a mere five years previously. So this uh, uh, business hired female bar attendants. The union, which was predominantly male and specifically prohibited women from being employed as bar attendants, uh, put a picket on the premises. And as a matter of law, a picket is lawful unless the plaintiff could establish that it infringed somebody's constitutional rights. So they argued that the picket infringed the constitutional rights to equality of their female employees. And Ms. Justice Kenny in the High Court refused to allow them to rely on Article 40, Section 1, because he held it wasn't a guarantee of equality for all purposes, but simply that citizens shall be held equal before the law 
as human persons, which relates to those features which makes them human beings. And he found really quite emphatically that the constitutional principle on equality had nothing to do with the workers' trading activities or the conditions on which they were employed. Now, in fairness to him, he was actually prepared to identify and accept the female employee's constitutional right to earn a livelihood, which he identified uh, as part of the unenumerated rights of Article 40, Section 3. And he did that by relying on the directive principles of social policy in Article 45, which includes that men and women have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. And this is fascinating in terms of how things subsequently developed. He was actually discouraged by the Defendant's Council from adopting this approach on the basis that in 1972, when we still had unequal pay in the public service, and it was pointed out to Mr Justice Kenny that if he was to allow the female employees to have a constitutional right to earn their livelihood, that it would render unequal pay between men and women, which was part of the public service remuneration structure, uh, unconstitutional. And uh, the judge got around that by saying that what was adequate in terms of uh, an adequate means to earn a livelihood was a matter for the Arachthus, but he did say that the threat of a picket, that women should not be employed solely because they are women, was a breach of their right to earn a livelihood, but not a breach of their right to equality. He did interestingly suggest that had the threat of a picket been because the work was unsuitable for women or too difficult or dangerous for them, that that might have rendered the picket lawful. So whilst Ultimately, he did restrain the picket for breaching the constitutional rights of the women to earn a livelihood. He firmly rejected any question of equal pay or equal working conditions for women existing as a constitutional right. And he confirmed that even their limited right to earn a livelihood could be restricted where the work was deemed to be unsuitable for them. Now, the workplace isn't the only place where women and members of minority groups might wish to participate, but it is undoubtedly an important context in which to assert the right to equality. So in 1972, the clear message from the Irish courts was that the constitution was not going to be of any real assistance to women in their fight for employment equality. That decision, of course, was handed down at a time when not only unequal pay was still in existence in the public service, but the marriage bar was still in existence, both in the public service and many other Irish workplaces. So the High Court, in finding that the constitutional principle of equality had nothing to do with the conditions under which citizens were employed, that constitutional right to equality was deprived of any real meaning or impact for Irish women who at that time were blatantly excluded from the workplace if they were married. And even if they were allowed in, they were lawfully treated less favorably than their male colleagues. A further difficulty with 40 section one is that it suffered from any lack, sorry, from the lack of any clear standard of review. Difficult to assess is the standard irrationality, is it disproportionality, or is it invidious discrimination? And even then, what does invidious discrimination mean? The, the concept of this standard of invidious discrimination was developed in American constitutional law in the context of infringement of the equality principles of civil rights legislation. The phrase first appeared in the Irish jurisprudence in the 1972 decision of O'Brien and Kyo to do with infants bringing uh, personal injury proceedings and the, the time limits applicable uh, to, to that. And after that decision, 
uh, it, it almost found it became popular in in being applied in many of the Article 40, Section 1 cases, but has been described un, as unsatisfactory for failing to deliver a concrete and objective standard and suggestive of deliberately created distinctions as expressions of a tacit prejudice. Moving on then, I want to look at how inequality has been justified in constitutional law. Because of course, Article 40, Section 1 <clears throat> is limited by this very wide qualification that it allows inequality to be excused by difference in capacity. And of course, yet again, that's a reflection of Catholic social teaching in the 1930s. And this qualification has allowed the courts to justify, usually in highly deferential reviews, state-mandated distinctions, ranging from the criminalization of homosexuality in the Norris case to the refusal of social welfare for deserted husbands in the, the Louth decision. Political and economic reality has been commonly used to justify inequality. The idea is that the individual should be protected against unnecessary state intrusions. This recognizes equality as a right akin to an individual right to freedom from unfair discrimination rather than a wider right to substantive equality or equality of resources or equality of outcome. This debate has been suggested as reflecting a major dividing line in Irish political and legal discourse about the perceived neoliberal orientation of Irish government policies in the mid-1990s. It can be seen in the stated equality concerns in the social partnership agreements in the 90s, alongside the many policy initiatives introduced to, to address questions of socioeconomic deprivation. In practice, the right to equality in Ireland is restricted by the law in many more and fundamental ways. For example, as a result of the referendum on citizenship, significant rights are denied to persons born in the state by reference to their parentage. Some representation in the Shannad is restricted to university graduates. Members of the Traveller and Roma communities remain severely disadvantaged. They and other disadvantaged groups have secured very little success in using the Constitution to challenge discriminatory legislation or policy. Having said that, on occasion, Article 41 has been used in a positive way in affirming the state's ability to introduce legislation uh, protecting people from unfair discrimination. In the, the Blaskade Moore decision, uh, what the courts referred to as pedigree was rejected as an acceptable form of distinction in determining who could or could not be subject to a compulsory purchase order and forced to sell their land to the state. Uh, Barrington held that a constitution should be pedigree blind just as it should be colour blind or gender blind except when those issues are relevant to a legitimate legislative purpose. In the, the, equality, the Employment Equality Bill reference, the Article 26 reference of the 1996 Employment Equality Bill and in the Port Marnock Golf Club case, the courts affirmed the state's ability to introduce anti-discrimination legislation in order to protect individuals against unfair treatment. Now, ultimately, the Port Marnock Golf Club decision upheld the right of the golf club to restrict membership for women. But Mr Justice O'Higgins did hold that the Oireachtas was entitled to legislate positively to, vi to validate, sorry, to vindicate and protect the value of equality. 
He affirmed the centrality of equality as a prime constitutional value and cited the dicta of Barrington in the Blasgate Moor case to the effect that Ireland is a democratic society committed to the principles of equality. O'Higgins considered that the constitutional interest in preventing unjust discrimination could outweigh freedom of association rights. So that was an important balancing exercise where equality was preferred to the competing constitutional right of freedom of association. Now, had this approach been progressed more, it could have led to a greater focus on achieving substantive equality and could have, have echoed how constitutional equality principles in the Canadian Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms and in the South African Constitution have been applied and the emphasis that has been placed on, on human dignity in both of those uh, jurisdictions. So to some extent, just when it looked like things were going to improve with a more liberal and useful interpretation of the equality principle, the more restrictive approach that was permitted by its wording became dominant. And in contrast to upholding anti-discrimination legislation in the Equality Bill reference and in the Port Marnock Golf Club case, the High Court found itself unable to identify a breach of Lydia Foy's rights to equality before the law as part of her constitutional rights. Uh, she had transitioned from male to female and argued that the state treating her differently to a biological female in the registration of her gender breached her constitutional right to equality. There's Justice McKechnie in the High Court held that any difference of treatment was not either unjust, invidious, or arbitrary. It wasn't until some years later on the implementation of the European Convention of Human Rights Act of 2003 that Dr. Foy was able to return to the High Court and secure a declaration of incompatibility of the statutory provision that refused to recognize her gender reassignment from the same judge. And actually, it was the first declaration of incompatibility that was uh, handed down under the 2003 Act. Similar, in a similar vein, uh, Section 62 of the Housing Act of 1966 had been repeatedly challenged as unconstitutional for allowing a housing authority to evict a tenant due to the behaviour of a family member residing with them. So rather than the antisocial behaviour of the tenant, it was the antisocial behaviour of their, their son or daughter, whoever, uh, uh, that justified the authority in evicting them. Um, so that was challenged as unconstitutional without any success until eventually uh, it was set aside by the same judge, by Justice McKechnie, as incompatible with the European Convention rights to privacy and family life in the, the Donegan and Dublin City Council case. So in effect, what we very clearly had, perhaps still have, is Irish courts recognising that the rights protected by the European Convention went considerably further than the rights afforded by the Constitution. So for an Irish person to secure meaningful rights to equality, they would have to look to Europe. So moving on then to look at how European law treated equality and ultimately developed equality to being recognised as a fundamental right of European law. European law has had an immeasurable impact on Irish employment equality rights almost from the moment when we joined the European communities in 1973. But in fact, when you dig a little deeper, go back a bit further, in spite of Europe having been such a powerful catalyst for change in Irish society in the 70s, the origins of the European communities did not always afford such meaningful and effective promotion of equality. 
and when you go back to the early days of the European Union, references to equality were really little more than, than lip service uh, within an engagement between member states that was primarily geared towards an economic union, albeit with some aspirations to political unity. Going back to the Schuman Declaration of May 1950 on the establishment of a European coal and steels communities, the communities were stated to be a first step in the Federation of Europe. But in spite of that, the eventual Treaty of Rome of 1957 focused primarily on economic integration. So whilst the treaty clearly outlaws discrimination on grounds of nationality, its commitment to sex equality seems to have been uh, as a result of a, a political compromise between two of the, the main players at that time, France and Germany, rather than a genuine objective of the communities. So on the one hand, the French believed that the harmonization of the social costs of production was necessary to ensure that businesses could compete within the common market on a fair and equal basis. And France had had uh, legislation on equal pay in place since the early 50s, as well as much more generous holiday and overtime pay than any of the other member states. So of course that meant a higher cost of producing French goods and an understandable concern on the part of the French that social costs needed to be distributed throughout the communities in order to avoid social dumping. Germany, on the other hand, believed that harmonisation of social costs would follow the common market. And the influential Germans advocated a minimum level of interference on wages and prices. The result was a compromise. The preamble to the Treaty of Rome emphasised the need to ensure an improvement in the quality of life for the peoples of the communities. Article 119, now 141, recognised the right to equal pay between men and women for equal work and has been described as providing the, the inspirational springboard for the subsequent huge developments in the area of, sexual, of sex equality. But it remained a silent promise for many years before, in 1976, but almost 20 years later, it was finally found by the Court of Justice to be capable of giving rise to direct effects and therefore having a relevance to citizens of the European communities. So even though it was nothing more than words, it did, just by its presence in the treaty, it did actually allow the communities to present and emphasize its human face against the criticism that the, the EC was economic, capitalist, and uncaring. So for example, back to 1972, the communique issued by the Paris summit meeting stated that the heads of state or government attached as much importance to vigorous action in the social field as to the achievement of monetary and economic union. Shortly after that summit, the social action programs were initiated and they expressly included the objective of securing equality between men and women. The 1973 social action program was followed by five more uh, social action programs. And eventually, by 1997, the Amsterdam Treaty gave a very strong new emphasis to equality of opportunity, irrespective of sex, and also aspired in Article 13 to extending European anti-discrimination legislation to other grounds of race, ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. So sex equality at that stage was well established. The other grounds were identified as an aspiration. Those developments and the increasing emphasis placed on equality as a fundamental principle of European law were intended at the economic level to prevent distortion of the market. But at a political level, the stated rights to equality definitely provided a platform for the Commission to demonstrate its commitment to social progress. It legitimised the union, it strengthened political integration. 
And by the time the Court of Justice did get around in the Dufresne and Sabina case to allowing an individual citizen of the communities to rely on the principle of equal pay in Article 119, uh, the court described the article as pursuing a double aim, which is at once economic and social, and shows that the principle of equal pay forms part of the foundations of the communities. So moving on then to look at how this foundation of the communities and the principles of European equality law was implemented in Ireland. Ireland's membership of the European communities in 1973 brought dramatic changes to the entire system of Irish law. They, it, it created a new legal order in which Ireland limited its sovereign rights and rendered European community law the most important source of Irish law, at least within the areas of, of its competence, which of course included employment equality. At an executive level, Ireland really did struggle with the implications of being subject to European sex equality law. Once we joined in 1973, almost immediately, uh, preparation had to be made for the implementation of equal pay legislation in order to implement the Equal Pay Directive of 1973. There was a huge amount of public backlash to introducing equal pay, and it was criticised for neutralising the financial gain from Ireland's membership, and in particular access to the Common Agricultural Policy, which was a huge factor in the farming community voting heavily in favour of membership of the, the EC. Uh, but of course, there was no choice. It was, this was the price of European membership. But uh, it is a true story that when the state sought, in, in making its preparations for implementing equal pay, uh, they had to set up a new category of decision makers known as equal pay officers who would determine cases of equal pay. That was their only job, to decide cases of equal pay. And the state put advertisements in the newspaper to recruit applicants for the newly created position of equal pay officers. And in those newspaper advertisements, different rates of pay were offered for male and female applicants. In the early years of the our membership of the communities, as well as the executive having its struggles, the judiciary also was on a learning curve. And initially, it had little or no tradition of referring cases to the Court of Justice. In the 30 years, between 1973 and 2003, the Irish courts got the, if you could call it an award, but statistically referred the least number of cases per year across the entire of the European communities. The judiciary also struggled to understand the true impact of Irish employment equality law for Irish women workers. Good example of that in the Murphy and Board Telecom case uh, uh, when the High Court referred one of the few questions of law that were referred to, to Luxembourg. And this was because the case concerned not just a straightforward a woman saying, I am doing work of equal value to my male counterpart and therefore I'm entitled to equal pay. This woman was able to prove, and the court accepted, that she was doing work of greater value than her male counterpart. But the Irish High Court had to refer a question of law to the Court of Justice to determine whether an entitlement to equal pay for work of equal value also meant equal pay for a woman doing work of greater value than her chosen male counterpart. And, and you almost get a sense from the decision of the Court of Justice of, really? Uh, so not surprisingly, the Court of Justice found that a woman in those circumstances could claim equal pay, but obviously had no entitlement to greater pay than the man who was doing work of less value. But by the 1980s, the Irish courts had become increasingly not just comfortable in their application of European employment equality law, but on occasions really quite radical. And in a number of areas, the courts and the legislature showed leadership in progressing equality. And a really good example of that can be seen in a, an area of law that 
that was surprisingly difficult and challenging in its early days, which was sexual harassment in the workplace. The Equal Treatment Directive of 1976 was implemented in Ireland by the Employment Equality Act of 1977, but neither the Directive nor the Irish Act made any reference to sexual harassment. But this was a concept that had only begun to be developed or even identified uh, in the United States in the late 70s. And in fact, prior to that, it was, it was known as the problem without a name. So one of these things, people knew it existed, but it wasn't even identified as a problem, never mind uh, uh, developing law that would potentially outlaw it. And it wasn't until a 1976 American decision of Burns and Castle, uh, which was the first time the US courts held that dismissing a woman for her refusal to comply with sexual demands made of her by management was discrimination on grounds of her sex and unlawful within the, the Civil Rights Act. The court said, but for her womanhood, her participation in sexual activity would never have been solicited. To say then that she was victimized in her employment simply because she declined the invitation is to ignore the asserted fact that she was invited only because she was a woman. <clears throat> By contrast, in Europe, there was huge difficulty in conceptualizing or understanding that uh, uh, legislation designed to outlaw discrimination on grounds of sex in relation to conditions of employment could potentially outlaw sexual harassment in the workplace. In 1983, a leading UK academic was able to cite a number of commentators who believed that sexual harassment in the UK was simply not illegal. In spite of that, only two years later, in 1985, the Irish Labour Court, chaired by its first and to date only female uh, chairperson, Evelyn Owens, handed down a historic and groundbreaking decision <clears throat> in a remarkably simple but vitally important analysis of the Employment Equality Act, the Labour Court said, Freedom from sexual harassment is a condition of work which an employee of either sex is entitled to expect. The court will accordingly treat any denial of that freedom as discrimination within the terms of the Employment Equality Act 1977. So not only was this the first time that the Irish Employment Equality Act had been applied to sexual harassment, it was also one of the earliest cases in which the legislation of a member state implementing the Equal Treatment Directive had been applied to outlaw sexual harassment in the workplace. And the Labour Court really wasn't found wanting. It formulated its legal protection in the widest possible way. It found there was an automatic right in every employment contract that an employee shall be entitled to a workplace free from sexual harassment, and the court would treat any denial of that term as unlawful discrimination. The European Union moved far more slowly to outlaw sexual harassment in the workplace. Even by 2002, a, a, over a decade after the Labour Court's 1985 decision, when the Equal Treatment Directive was amended, the Commission, the best it was doing was encouraging employers to combat sexual harassment. It wasn't until the, the recast Equal Treatment Directive in 2006 that sexual harassment was finally defined and expressly outlawed in European law. Ireland also strode ahead of its European neighbours in its application of employment equality law in pregnancy discrimination. Equality law for many years really struggled to recognize the link between pregnancy discrimination and gender discrimination. And there really was a, a, quite an infamous UK case that described people as falling into three categories. There were men, there were women, and there were women, and the court quoted the good book, with child. And therefore, less favorable treatment of a woman with child did not constitute unlawful gender discrimination. Many cases would only find the dismissal of a pregnant woman unlawful where there was evidence that a man with an illness necessitating the same period of time off work would not also have been treated in the same manner. 
Eventually, in the 1990s, pregnancy discrimination was recognised by the European Court of Justice as unlawful direct gender discrimination. And that has had a huge impact throughout the European Union on protecting women from discrimination on grounds of their pregnancy. But in fact, well before that decision, the Irish courts had recognised discriminatory treatment on grounds of pregnancy as a requirement, i.e. the requirement not to be pregnant, with which fewer women could comply and therefore pregnancy discrimination was unlawful indirect discrimination on grounds of gender. Now, it wasn't as strong as recognising it as direct discrimination. The, the essential difference is indirect discrimination can be justified, direct discrimination can't be justified, so it's much stronger. But it was significantly better than this artificial categorization of a pregnant woman falling outside of the protection of gender discrimination unless she could compare herself to a sick man. So as well as those forward-thinking approaches to sexual harassment and pregnancy discrimination coming from the courts, Ireland went significantly ahead of Europe in outlawing discrimination at a legislative stage on, on grounds other than the gender and marital status, which was recognised in European law. In 1998, the Rainbow Coalition government introduced the radical Employment Equality Act, which extended the protections that had been previously afforded by European law to sex and marital status to seven new grounds of discrimination, family status, age, disability, religion, membership of the traveller community, race and sexual orientation. And in fact, race was defined to include nationality, which is an extension of protection that even European law to date has not achieved. So even now, even though European law has caught up with the, the new grounds, Irish law is still ahead of European law in that we outlaw discrimination in the workplace on grounds of nationality rather than simply uh, uh, by reference to race. The Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997 in Article 13 had aspired to extending the principles of non-discrimination to the areas of racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age and sexual orientation. It actually wasn't implemented until the recast directive in 2006. So Ireland found itself to the forefront of having developed a jurisprudence in non-discrimination on grounds of age, race, religion and disability at a time when the European Union was coming to grips with those principles for the very first time. There was a bittersweet irony in our European neighbours looking to us for guidance on how these principles of non-discrimination were operating in practice, given the reluctance with which we had taken on the requirements of European equality law back in the early 70s. So, drawing some conclusions to my remarks, in, in tracing the narrative of Irish equality law, we see a traditional conservative society in which discrimination against women was lawful and accepted. But we see that moving full circle to making genuine attempts to bring equality to the workplace and elsewhere. Irish women participate now far more equally in civil society and in the workplace than they did in the 1970s and earlier. Undoubtedly, more could have been done, and a lot remains to be done. The gender pay gap is still a stark reality. Women who choose to have children continue to see that impact negatively on their careers. Women continue to experience harassment of all types in the workplace and beyond. The law has achieved some success in challenging these behaviours, but has not yet eradicated them. This is an ongoing struggle at a national and European level. But the will to force change through the law is there. And the law will continue to be a real tool of change in bringing about greater equality in Irish society. I thank you and I leave you with the succinct and very brilliant words of our president of our European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, 
following her recent experiences in Turkey. This goes to the core of who we are. This goes to the values our union stands for. And this shows how far we still have to go before women are treated as equals, always and everywhere.